Well, Nicholas Kenyon, thank you so much for coming on to Forte Podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, how are you, first of all? Uh, it, it's a great pleasure to have you here and to be able to uh, reflect on some of the many, many things that have gone on <laughs> through this really, really extraordinary period that yes. we've lived through. Yes. So I, welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me to your beautiful home too. So there's a lot to talk about in terms of your career. Uh, so I'm going to uh, sort of go an unconventional route for myself. I don't normally like to go from the beginning because a lot of people would like to go from the beginning and go through chronologically in someone's life. So I'm going to break that rule for myself today and just sort of explore your early life with music first. So can you tell us a bit about your early experiences with music? So I did not come from a, a very musical family. I, I didn't grow up in a situation where my parents were music professionals or anything. They they liked music, but they were not especially involved in it. So I think it was a bit of a surprise to them when I, and then my sister, who's three years younger than me, became so interested in music. And I think looking back on it, the absolutely formative thing that did that for me was church choir. I I was brought up a Roman Catholic, uh, joined the local Catholic uh, parish church choir, and through that got to know a whole range of, of wonderful music, which wasn't the conventional concert mainstream at all. It was Bird, it was Talis, Palestrina, Victoria, uh, and and so on. And as a result of that, I and the musical interest that I clearly had. Uh, my parents encouraged me to have piano lessons, and I then went, and I think this was a, a pretty uh, defining experience. I was sent as one of two choir boys from this choir to a summer school for choir boys at Westminster Cathedral in London. And as part of that, um, we were conducted by the former master of music there, George Malcolm, who became a, a really major influence. And we were also taken to a prom rehearsal. And completely coincidentally, that prom rehearsal was Jacqueline Dupre playing the Elgar Cello Concerto. Wow. So as a result of that, I had to take up the cello, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> which, How could you not? Yeah. Which, okay. I, which I did yeah. and joined a local youth orchestra Quite soon after that, however, the local youth orchestra had a, a spare bassoon, and I was suddenly interested in the idea of being one of two bassoons <laughs> rather than being one of 12 cellos, <laughs> uh, pointing to some incipient individuality <laughs> that I had. So that was what I did, and um, I played the bassoon for uh, a good while, um, until I heard other people doing it better, and then it was <laughs> a bit depressing. So did you continue the cello in tandem with the bassoon, or did you stop? No, I didn't. Stop? I I gave up the cello and uh, took up the bassoon instead, uh, largely to play in the local Stockport Youth Orchestra, mm. because uh, I, I didn't mention the fact that this is all up north in, in uh, the south of Manchester, uh, in what was a very, very flourishing musical environment, generally, there was a lot going on. Um, and um, I think that the conductor of the youth orchestra, who was my first cello teacher, was actually quite pleased when I took up the bassoon instead. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so at, at that time, how, how old were you at this time? Well, uh, the, the choir school was when I was 11 or 12. Right. Um, so church choir, I suppose I joined seven or eight. But the other thing was that when I went to um, grammar school, Catholic grammar school in Manchester, the only music they had going on there was uh, nothing academic at all, but they did an annual Gilbert and Sullivan opera. And uh, I, <clears throat> when my treble voice was still a treble voice, it was quite good of its kind. So I, f I found myself singing Patience, Impatience, and Iolanthe and Iolanthe. And that was another uh, very, very decisive musical um, experience. Mm. 
At, at that time, were there desires within you to do this professionally, or did you have other ambitions in mind? Ah, well, that's a very good question. I, I think that I was not thinking at that time at all of music as a possible profession, particularly as I wasn't studying it academically at all. Mm. Um, I think my parents were very keen that however much music I did, I had something sensible to fall <laughs> back on. And so they encouraged me to read history at university. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that I did that. Um, I, I rather fear that if I'd tried to read music at university and grappled with, you know, six-part reversible counterpoint, <laughs> I probably wouldn't enjoy it now as much as I do. So uh, I think I always felt that music would be my great hobby in life. I knew lots of people around Manchester who were lawyers and accountants and wonderful amateur musicians. And I, I think I thought I would go into publishing or journalism or something like that mm. uh, and uh, have music on the side. Yes. But it, it didn't quite turn out that way. Right. So was there a worry or concern on your part that if it actually became professional, uh, when it came to music, you would lose your love for it. Was, was that your thinking? I, I, I think that was a fear, perhaps not a conscious fear, but certainly a subconscious mm. fear. Uh, and so I did want to have something that I could fall back on. And in terms of reading something like history um, at Oxford, which I was lucky enough to do, um, that gave you well to some people it trains you for nothing to other people <laughs> what they would say is it tra trains you to think in a very decisive uh, uh way and i always said in the pre-internet days that the great thing it taught you was to go into a library and find the right paragraph in the right book within 20 minutes but of course now you know you only have to put it into google and you've got whatever answer it was you were searching for but i think history really gave one a discipline of organization and thinking and logical presentation and that is something that I think has always been very influential with me. Mm. Do you use the internet to search for things as much now, or do you still, I see you have a, a house full of books, <laughs> do you still have that habit within you to go look into a book and try to find something? I still need books, yep. yes. I, I do use the internet a huge amount to search for things, and the, the, the stuff that is available now is absolutely remarkable, but you are trudging through a lot of sludge, <laughs> if, to use a technical term, in terms of finding what you want. And I still find the sensation of not only reading a book, but looking things up in books. Is, is a very satisfying way to research. Mm. Yes. Uh, it, it, there's also the uh, the tangible quality as well when you're flicking through pages yes. and running your fingers down the paragraphs and trying to find the key words that you want. There's yes. something quite satisfying about there the is. whole... And being journey. able to flick backwards and forwards uh, very, very simply and in intuitively. Yes, 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 exactly. And so I'm a bit Luddite in that respect, I, <laughs> I grant you, and there are too many books, but uh, I can never bring myself to actually get rid of books, because they are what has made one what one is. Yes. And I can assure you, it's even worse with CDs, but you just can't <laughs> see them here. <laughs> In what way? In what way are they worse with CDs? Well, I mean, I have an absurdly large collection of CDs that I have amassed over the years of reviewing and uh, and listening, uh, but they are now in a garage in the country. <laughs> I see. <laughs> um, so, what prompted you to take up history? What was it about history that really fascinated you? That I was very well taught history at school. I should put that in the right order. I was taught history very well <laughs> at school. I was also taught English very well at school by a pupil of F.R. Leavis. And I think um, the, the balance was between history and English. Um, but in the end, history just seemed a, a, a really compelling set of narratives to explore. Mm. And what was your favourite period of history to study? Well, Did my favourite paper 
at Oxford because you know you did the broad sweep of history albeit that it started it, it finished in about 1939 you know you weren't right. allowed to go much further than that uh, but you also did some special subjects I did something on the Crusades but the one I enjoyed most was we were able to do a term on English Baroque architecture which right. was just beginning to be an interest of mine and one of the absolutely leading scholars uh, of that area was next door to Balliol at St John's College. Mm. So um, that, w that was a very uh, refreshing and uh, you know, quite unusual thing to study. Yes, and what was the thing you learned that really has, has stuck with you till now? Was was one bit of information that's really stuck with you? Um, I wouldn't say information. I, I would say ways of ferreting information out. Oh. So English Baroque architecture, one enormously interesting thing was the project. Everybody knows about Christopher Wren's city churches, but after Christopher Wren's city churches, there was another project around 1711, 1715, to call the 50 new churches, which they intended to build in London for the new population. And in fact, only a handful of got them actually got built. Mm. And, you know, looking at why that happened and where the ones that happened happened and why they happened was a very, very good case study yes and if if it's if wikipedia is correct i people will crucify me for looking at wikipedia but <laughs> uh, it said that you after you graduated from studying history at Balliol college you went to work at the english bark festival and was there a connection between your fascination with in, <laughs> in Baroque architecture to go into work at a Baroque music festival? No, not <laughs> I can't I can't pretend that it was that logical. Okay. You're very you're very generous to suppose <laughs> that it was logical. No, um. I'll tell you exactly what happened, which is I had organized, although I wasn't playing a lot of music at Oxford, I had organized some concerts and I got the chance to do um a year's course in arts administration straight after Balliol and that was at the um, uh, what was then the central London Polytechnic big white building opposite Baker Street and as a result of that I got a secondment with the English Bark Festival and that was how I began to work for them so no that was really due to my great enthusiasm for Bach and Baroque music generally uh, that that worked out so well mm. And George Malcolm, who I mentioned in terms of the choir school at Westminster Cathedral, was also heavily involved with Baroque music, played at the Bach Festival, uh, and so on. So that was a very uh, natural link. I see. And what were your responsibilities at the Bach Festival? Uh, I mean. Essentially, my responsibilities were to edit the programme book, uh, all the programme notes, all the material, and to, to edit that for publication. But it was a very small um, outfit run from a house in Belgravia by a rather eccentric Greek harpsichordist. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful benefit of it as a sort of baptism of fire for anybody getting into the arts was that the, the artistic director, <coughs> who was called Lena Lalandi, was a wonderful person, but not always very clear. And one will get rung up by artists saying, um, I've just had this 45-minute conversation with Lena. Can you explain what it is I've agreed to do? <laughs> <laughs> and so one was always in the swim of it so I did some marketing and then of course when the festival actually came on we were all pushing pianos and harpsichords and chairs around so it was uh, it was a very very good start mm. so it was sort of like your first glimpse into into music administration yes, and arts it was administration. it was ah, yes um and um I didn't um learn enough about what to avoid <laughs> And then you, I, I'm so fascinated by how you ended up as the director of BBC Proms. Can mm. you sort of tell us the journey? How did you get there? Yes, you know, yes. Well, it's quite baffling for me to remember that myself. <laughs> um, so we're talking um, middle of the 70s here, which before you were born. And the, the 
the journey that I went on did not go in a logical way from that first experience of the English Bach Festival through a music administration route, which is what you would have expected, because I got, um, you might say deflected, or you might say it was the right way to go, into reviewing and musical journalism. There was a very interesting thing going on in music at that time, which was it was the beginning of the revival of interest in early music and early performance practice. There were a whole load of groups growing up at that point. You think of David Munro's Early Music Consort, Christopher Hogwood's Academy of Ancient Music, Trevor Pinnock's English Concert, uh, putting on concerts uh, i'd had some contact with them through the english bark festival because lena lalandi was very encouraging of that area of performance but the regular music critics who had spent 20 30 years listening to aida and Wozzeck did not really embrace the early music revival and so I found myself being asked to review a lot of concerts with various different papers um, in, in the early music area. And so that was what I did through the 70s. And as a result of that, got asked in um, 79 to go to New York and write for The New Yorker with Andrew Porter, who was a, a great British music critic of the time. Um, and that was a wonderful, a wonderful experience. Um, I was just stepping in for him while he went off to do various other things like direct operas. So we came back in 82. We're still a decade away from me really going back into music administration and, and working for Radio 3. So the 80s were a, a really, really thriving, fantastic time in terms of musical activity and I did a whole jumble of things I mean I reviewed a ridiculous number of concerts a year for the times that was you know on an overnight basis I edited a magazine called early music which is still published by Oxford University Press really great magazine and I also worked a day a week for the BBC's magazine the listener uh, and edited music uh, uh, articles and previews for them. So it, the 80s were a, a, a very busy and very thriving time. I think then at the end of it, particularly as a critic, you, you just get slightly fed up with um, criticising everybody else and you feel you need to put yourself you know forward as someone who might conceivably be able to do some of this stuff so I think that was when I started getting involved in putting on festivals and and then put myself forward for the Radio 3 um, controllership not thinking at all that that would be something I would get then but that it was you know putting down a marker for later on um, but there was a very tricky situation going on at that time. We're talking 1992 here, which was the BBC was replacing its control of Radio 3 at exactly the same time that Classic FM was beginning as a commercial classical network. And I think <clears throat> people were pretty... They were pretty uh, worried about what the effect of that on Radio 3 might be. So, in a sense, I had nothing to lose and um, was was able to slip in, in, uh, under the wire on that one. Hmm. Uh, you know, when you were given the job, were you, were you excited? Were you apprehensive? Were you <laughs> confident? Was, How did you feel when... when... I was bewildered. <laughs> um, and I always remember going on a... Um, management course that the BBC sent one on a week at the London Business School was you know all you needed to run this massive network and having uh, other people chief execs of of big big companies uh, in the room all explaining their career paths and where they'd come from and where they'd gone to and 
when I described my career path through reviewing and running a small magazine and so on and so forth, I always remember the chap running the course. He just looked at me and he said, hmm, it's a very strange appointment, <laughs> <laughs> which wasn't deeply reassuring, but, you know, it was, it was, a, fair, it was a fair point <clears throat> to make. I mean, the BBC in those days had a lot of support structures in place. So if you think about running things, you know, there was a whole personnel department to run there. There were people to run the money. There were producers to produce the programmes. What one was doing was taking an overview and helping to shift the strategy of the mm. channel. Mm. And that is what we were really there to do. Mm. And some of it worked and some of it didn't. But a lot of what we put in place uh, at Radio 3, some of it infuriated people because radio is such a personal medium. I think that's, that's one of the really important things. Um, so it inf infuriated people, but a lot of what we put in place is still there today, you know, in terms of particular programmes and particular presenters and so on. Mm. So I feel from that point of view that we did a good job of moving on the culture of the times mm. in terms of in terms of classical music and radio. Mm. I'm really interested you said radio was a very personal medium. Um, mm. The only theory I could probably put to that is because radio will be in someone's home. Yes. It, would that be your reasoning for... Totally. And, and on a one-to-one -one basis, usually. Right. So changing something on the radio... I always used to say, is like moving somebody's toothbrush in the bathroom. <laughs> you know, what's, what's that doing there? The archers 15 minutes later, you know, that's impossible. Right. Um, so I, I think you had to become aware of the um, intense feeling of belonging that people had to radio. And mm. I think that was particularly true with uh, with Radio Three. Mm. Um, I was set, I still got it somewhere. I was sent um, by someone who objected to my changes. I was sent a small black Bakelite on-off switch from his radio. And he said, uh, dear sir, you may return this to me once you have re revoked your changes. <laughs> <laughs> oh no which of course i never did and no, <laughs> nor did my successors but you know that that was so that was the sort of feeling you had to do i think possibly uh, in the beginning we were too demonstrative about what we were doing i think one of the ways to change radio is to change it a bit by stealth right uh, you know. <laughs> but i'm very very pleased that things that we invented at the time like um Private Passions with Michael Barclay, In Tune with Sean Rafferty, those programmes are still up and running and, and a key part of the network. Mm. So I, I want to do it like a little comparison between, you know, being the administrator for a very, very large organisation, very large projects such as the Beauty Proms, mm. and maybe a smaller scale, um, however small that may be, um, small as in you're the only person doing it. Yes. Because when you're in a... Because I, I was an administrator before. Right. Um, when I was doing my bachelor's, I, I organized a symphonic concert uh -huh. for Ravel's Piano Concerto and yes. paired with Shostakovich's Jazz Suite Number no. 2. Yep. And I was the only one doing everything. I was the, <laughs> I was, I was the one liaising with the, the yes. stage managers and... Mm drawing up seating plans, going to budget meetings, mm. talking with photographers to take photos of my performers, yes. um, contacting all of the guest uh, instrumentalists. Yes. Because I, I couldn't go and get the reserve for the orchestra. I had to build my own orchestra from scratch. Yes. Well, all I can say is you look pretty well on, the, on it. I'm amazed you survived because that's... my hair's my hair's my hair's grown back since then. The but uh, but I can I can reassure you that most people start that way. Yes, and um, I've recently been researching at Cambridge and looking at uh, concerts that were put together in exactly the way you describe from from scratch. Um, I never quite did that, but but for me. 
the, the contrast that you described was between being a single-handed, self-motivating writer and reviewer and then having to take on this huge bureaucracy and work out how to shift it five or ten degrees. Yes, and with lots of people in the mix as well. Yes. Um, but the, the comparison I, I wanted to make was that when you're working in a big organisation, you have people working with you at the same mm. time. So you that then leads to less pressure on yourself to make decisions and to see the overview of the project. Um, so what, what was not, e- what not was necessarily right. because yes. Yes. you're spending a lot of your time balancing up or adjudicating between the different views of the people who are working for you. And that is that is always, and particularly, I think that was true of the BBC in the old days, where it was very internally focused, and there wasn't a sufficient um, outward-looking view of the audience. It tended to be special interest groups um, uh, clashing within the organisation because they wanted their agenda to prevail. Mm. So it was more you know, running the United Nations, really, <laughs> than it was running a cultural organisation. Yeah. Did that hinder process in any way or slow things down? Or well, yes, a, because yeah. um, there was always a tendency in the BBC for people to be very enthusiastic when you suggested something. Yes. Uh, they would run off and then after nothing happened, <laughs> they would sort of come back and say, well, I'm really sorry, it just didn't turn out to be possible. Right. So getting people to have a sense of direction and to feel that things could change and to know what they were aiming at. I mean, the, the big thing we were trying to do was to have Radio 3 presented uh, in a way that people could uh, hear that those presenting it were doing so from a position of knowledge and enthusiasm. And that was quite a tricky thing. What people loved was, uh, in the conservative side of the audience, was the Radio 3 voice that was sort of anonymous, but, you know, was not pretending to be an expert, whereas I wanted people who were more involved and more committed. Mm. And when you were a director, what kind of vision did you have for the music music scene? What kind of things were you planning to to program? What were your ambitions? Well, I I think what the ambition was that Radio 3 should remain at the heart of the cultural life of the country, that the BBC orchestras should be used to reach out to as many people as possible uh, by giving public concerts, by becoming involved in education, and that we should find ways of celebrating this huge diversity and huge amount of achievement Uh, while at the same time pushing the art form forward so that the BBC's role in commissioning new music, encouraging young composers and young talent was absolutely a key part of the the life of the network. Mm. Um, And I think, you know, to a large extent, we did that round creating major projects in 95 we created a whole year of british music uh, because that was purcell's anniversary and tippett's birthday um that was uh, fairest isle that was a, a very high profile series and then at the end of the 20th century 97 to 99 we put together a series called Sounding the Century, which was really a retrospective of of everything worthwhile written in the 20th century. Um, So these were not small-scale things. They were big, demonstrative projects, but I think they they succeeded in making the network noticed. Mm. What what contributes to your decision-making when it comes to a programme? Does it come from what's happening in society and you try to reflect that in the program mm. or what what goes through your decision making well there are so many factors involved in any decision like that uh, to do with the program but what i would say uh i think we me and my immediate team did very well at the proms 
was not to make it a top-down exercise where we just wrote programs down on a piece of paper and handed them out to conductors and orchestras to get on with but we had constant discussions with conductors and orchestras as to what they wanted uh, um, uh, to perform and what they thought they would be good at performing and sometimes they were not um uh, what's the term they were not entirely accurate in their um uh, assessment of what they would be good at if you see what I mean and so you had to nudge it in a certain way mm. but I think my my aim through the whole proms period was to balance the core repertory which we knew was what uh, attracted a quarter of a million people to buy tickets for the concerts every year to balance that up with a really vigorous approach to new works and new commissioning and of course that was a risk because some new pieces work and some don't but with the proms you have this incredibly open-minded audience that is prepared to um, uh, take a punt on that particularly if what you're also offering them in the programme is something that they know they will enjoy. Mm. I, so would a sort of a strategy, we'll mm. move on to contemporary music and try and make that more um, sort of, uh, how do you say, accessible to, yes. the, to the modern audience, contemporary audience. Um, a lot of people, especially a lot of concert organisers that I know, they normally try to couple contemporary music with a lot more well-known mm -hmm. composers, mm -hmm. just so that they don't throw them into the deep end for a full contemporary concert. That would is that a very effective way? Do you think, or do you think there's another way that we can do, or administrators can do to ease people in? Um, I think there are m many ways in which that could go. So at the proms, we certainly used that uh, technique that you just described of putting <coughs> excuse me of putting Harrison Burt whistle alongside Beethoven 9 yep and the place would be packed <laughs> and people would be exposed to Harrison Burt whistle and either enjoy it or not but they were willing to take the risk on that and that was that was marvelous um you can also create um very well made programs of entirely contemporary music we tended to do that more in the late night concerts uh, of the proms and that that appeals to a particular niche audience uh, the thing i really learned from my proms predecessors um was that a conductor like pierre boulez uh who, who was such a, an important figure uh for the bbc he had enormous skill at placing contemporary music in the context of great pieces that helped it to make sense. Right. So, you know, the background of the 20th century repertory in terms of Stravinsky, Debussy, Ravel, Bartok, and so on, was a very, very important background to then putting in something uh, absolutely contemporary. So I, I think there are numerous ways to go about it, but I think the important thing is to set up a trust between the promoter and the audience that even if it turns out that in the end they don't like what it is, uh, it will have been worth hearing. Mm. And I think that's the that's the very important link that one has to make, and mm. I, which I think the proms does make. Yes, and it wasn't just a haphazard decision. Just no, for, no. everything was everything thought was out thought or, out. Yes, or yes. most things. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's what most people who don't listen to classical music don't really understand. No, no. Mm. Sometimes, we, well, they normally think that we just throw music mm. in together just because we we like it some people do do that, that mm. that's that's their choice but sometimes people do take a lot of consideration when it mm. comes to their programs yes. yes um it's almost like when a chef picks out his his three course meal and absolutely yeah. and remember that we're also doing that over a season as well as in a single concert oh so the balance of what you're managing to include over a season is vital that's a huge puzzle, isn't it? Yes, yes. So, so and, en and an enjoyable 
uh, puzzle. Yes. Uh, and of course, you know, it fits together. The different building blocks fit together in different ways at different times. Uh, but you can be pretty sure that certain elements need to be in place. Certain performers need to be in place. Um, and then you start adding and adding until you have something that adds up as mm. a whole season. Mm. Um, I, I noticed that, you know, you mentioned New Yorker, the New Yorker mm. that you work for. Um, first of all, would you consider yourself a journalist or a music administrator or both? Um, what would you say you're? <laughs> who are, who are, I, what are you? <laughs> yes. Um, I would call myself, um, fundamentally a critic and writer about music okay. who has been fortunate enough to be able to put some of those things into practice as a music administrator. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> and now, um, having, you know, concluded what was 30 years, really, of management, if you put together Radio 3, the Proms, and then the Barbican, yes. Um I'm very happy to be returning to business as a sole trader, as it were, <laughs> and doing writing and research on on that basis. But I would not have missed the experience of being able to work with big teams of people yes. to deliver huge events. Mm. That's very, very rewarding. Yes, yes. Uh, I'd just like to talk about music criticism, if mm. I may. Um, so The New Yorker, I think this was about last year that they wrote this it's how to be a critic oh, I, don't really? if you've, I don't know if you've read that it's sort of like a uh, a how-to guide mm. um, so I'd like to quote just one sentence yes. um, just to start this conversation so the New Yorker criticism is a damned and doomed activity because critics have or should have a sick feeling of bad faith every time they lift the pen or strike the keyboard <laughs> close quote any thoughts on that? <laughs> And I hesitate to wonder who wrote that. <laughs> I, I couldn't disagree with, more with that. Interesting, okay. Because yeah. uh, I think the, f the enlightened function of a critic is to mediate between the artwork and the public, between the performer and the listener, because I've always regarded myself as being in the broadest and most, you know, uh, serious sense, a popularizer. I, I want to make the stuff that I write about uh, more available to people, more accessible to people, and that people should read what I write about something and say, oh, I must go and listen to that. I think that that's where I'm starting from, the role of the critic. And then maintaining the highest standards of performance which leads one to what people would uh, cliche regard as criticize, mm -hmm. um, is a secondary part of that activity. Uh, I'm always happier writing a positive review of something than I am writing a negative review of something. Although it must be said that, of course, negative reviews make quite good reading. <laughs> Uh, whereas generalized uh, positive reviews probably don't. Yeah. Have you had to write many of those negative reviews? <laughs> well, I wrote one just um, <laughs> oh, just, <recently. laughs> just the other day. But uh, on the, no, 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 not too many. Not too sure. many. Do you uh, sometimes feel guilty about writing negative reviews or uh, do you do it? Is, is this I suppose part of your job? I, I feel um, now in a slightly different way that I felt when I was writing criticism before I'd ever run anything. Oh. Um, before I'd ever run anything, I think it was easier for me to write um, completely negative reviews without uh, thinking about the impact <laughs> on uh, performers or organisations and so on. So I hope maybe now... If I write a negative review, I do it in a slightly more responsible way hmm. than I used to. More care with words or more care yes, with phrasing yes, something. It, it may not be as much fun to read, though. <laughs> uh, so you work for The New Yorker. You were the reviewer for The New Yorker, um, which is a 
huge publication. Mm. Uh, and you lived in yes over there. Tell us about your time there. What was it? What was it like? Uh, well, that was, it was uh, because what I was doing was stepping in uh, for Andrew Porter when he was away. We were there for three years. Mm-hmm. Um, it was absolutely unforgettable time. Um, we went when our first child was nine months old, um, and she is still in touch with people that she met in the Riverside Park playground. We lived on the Upper West Side, walking distance from Lincoln Centre and Carnegie Hall. So all that was fantastic. And in the New Yorker, you had a sort of Rolls Royce of uh, a publication, which was so well run and so well edited and so carefully, um, you know, the legendary fact checkers would sit in a room and look at your copy and, you know, say... Um, things like, uh, well, when you say Beethoven wrote his pastoral symphony in in um, 1806, you're sure he didn't start in December 1805. <laughs> um, so every little detail was was carefully, yeah. and that was that was something that doesn't exist um, to a huge extent elsewhere. And um, people read it. And, uh, you know, there was an immense following. And I think Andrew Porter had uh, really established a remarkable following as the leading music critic active in America at that time. Mm. And his collected reviews uh, make incredibly good reading. And he has a lot of interesting things to say about the function of criticism as well in the introductions to those books. So... um, it was um, a very lively time. It was very stimulating in terms of writing. Um, and it was something that I've kept connections with ever since. You know, I go back to, or before the pandemic anyway, I went back to New York a lot and still keep in touch with people there. Mm. Do you still read in New Yorker these days? I look at it. I don't. I, I don't <laughs> read every word, but then I don't think anybody does. <laughs> uh, you know, how, how can people get better at being, um, crit- like critics? I mean, in art, in books, in movies, but in general, how can we better? How can we better ourselves at being critics? If someone's a, someone's watching this, aspiring to be a critic. Oh, I see. It, the actual practice of criticism. Yes. The only thing that works is ruthless self-criticism. Oh. Uh, you, you just have, in my, my feeling anyway, you have to be aware of when a sentence works and when a sentence doesn't work. You have to be aware of the sort of information that you are putting across to the reader. You cannot assume that the reader knows everything that you know mm. uh, about a piece of music. Uh, on the other hand, just showing off that you do know stuff doesn't get you very far <laughs> either. Um <clears throat> I think the best piece of advice I received from one of the music critics I I worked with was just say how it was. Mm. So what you're trying to do is to actually bring to life the experience of going to a concert or an opera and, you know, maybe you didn't like it, but the audience was on its feet cheering. Say that. I mean, why uh, criticism? Why not just write articles? What was it about criticism that really drew you to it? Uh, The immediacy of it. Okay. And that people want to know now, what was it like last night? Right. And, you know, you can write, uh, you know, written hundreds of articles in my time, um, but there isn't that same sense of, here I am going to a concert on the South Bank, going to the Gray's Inn Road and sitting in an office with an old typewriter and typing a certain number of words to say what happened. Mm. And that's all part of the, the conversation. It's part of a conversation with your readers. Um, and you just have to assume that they are interested in the sort of things that you're talking about. And 
deliver to them as honest uh, an opinion as you can as to what matters. And I think particularly uh, in that early period that I was talking about when I was reviewing a lot of early music concerts that the conventional music critics on the whole didn't didn't take so much of an interest in, I think I had a, a proselytising aim there, <laughs> which was, you know, to, to get the audience interested in this style of performance and this repertory and show that there was as much in it as there was in, in all the other music that was performed and written about. Mm. And I still feel that. Mm. But I, I, I really... Um sort of was uh, inspired by that thing you said but to be a critic you have to criticize yourself first mm. i think i found that really interesting actually thank you for sharing that <laughs> <laughs> uh just a just a final question because mm. I, I wish i can speak yeah. to you for much much longer um just to sort of wrap it up a bit of a philosophical question um what does music mean to you and what is its purpose in society well that is um a, a, a tricky one to answer with any short answer, but in in writing the most recent book that I did called The Life of Music, uh, I did have one or two things to say about that. And what I have always felt, and I think it is still profoundly true, is that music is one of the things that enables people to come together in a non-confrontational way. And I think that we see so many examples in the world today of confrontation of all sorts of negative kinds. What we need is a voice that enables people to relate to each other. And that was something that I felt very much when running the proms. You would look out there every night and see 5,000 people sharing an experience, which wasn't to say that they were all hearing it the same way. They were all hearing it in their individual way and reacting to it in their individual way. But in a completely non-threatening arena, they came together and had a unique power because of that unity through performance. So I think to me that's always been the essence of music in its many, many, many guises. And I think that's one of the reasons that still keeps me hugely involved and hugely enthusiastic uh, about music and very optimistic for its future. Nicholas Kenyon, thank you so much. Thank you.